Here's a 2012 GLK 350. Now when they're new, you could have got one of these for between forty and sixty thousand dollars. So needless to say, they weren't giving the things away. Now this particular one is a two-wheel drive version, rear-wheel drive, classic rear-wheel drive. It's not all-wheel drive. And now that this thing is eight years old, it goes for about one-third of its original price. Realistically, it's lost about two-thirds of its original price in eight years. Now they're not over brimming with power. It's got a V6 engine, puts out about 268 horsepower. It's no slug, but it's no race car either. And in a city, this gets about 15 miles a gallon if you drive it conservatively. Now that isn't surprising a vehicle that weighs over two tons, the thing weighs over 4,000 pounds. Makes them ride decently, they're comfy inside. Typical Mercedes-Benz comforts. Leather seats, the typical Mercedes, it's cracking here, they always end up cracking there. Got a lot of space in the back, dual sunroofs, and when we get inside, got the usual little small back. You can put the seats down, like any SUV, and carry a reasonable amount of stuff in it. It's got the luggage rack, so you can put even more stuff on top if you want to. But of course, it's a Mercedes-Benz. That's why this thing, eight years old, has already lost two-thirds of its value. Now, I'm going to scan it, because the customer wants me to check it out with my fancy scan tool. We'll see what's going on inside it electronically. So we plugged it in, and now comes the fun. We'll turn the key on, so the idiot lights are on, the car's not running. Push the old Mercedes-Benz button, and away we go. It only takes a while just to initialize the system. That pretty much shows you the complexity of these Mercedes. They are uber complex. Okay, now it's initialized, now it's going to scan. That's going to take a while too. It's running through. Their idea of quick and mine, two completely different universes. I guess they mean quick in terms of geological time here. <laughs> it's only got two codes for the tire pressure monitoring system, which is no big deal. Fault for the right front door, which is no big deal. Now we'll look at some of the live data. See what kind of information comes out. We'll check out test failures. We're driving the full load range. Now right away I can see this data is bad. Red means bad. You can see it's out of specs, but when I rev it up, you can feel the engine isn't running right. It got a little into the black here. But now as you can hear when I rev it up under the engine, listen. You can hear a little, but I feel shudder. This engine has problems. And even though it didn't show serious trouble codes yet on the OBD information, realize the OBD information is the tip of the iceberg. When some of that information goes too far, it'll put the check engine light on, can't get your car inspected, but the data that this computer gets is much deeper. And as you can see, the data for the cams was way off. And I can feel it rumble when I accelerated it up and down. Shame we don't have rumble feature like in those old movies where they shook the seats when they had earthquakes because you would have felt it. This engine is not long for the earth. And it may be a Mercedes-Benz V6 engine, but they are insanely complex inside. Having these things worked on cost a fortune. You have to replace an engine like this, the sky's the limit. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Here we got an old trailblazer. It's running poorly. It was purchased, used. It sat for over a year, and it may have sat for five or six years before that. Misfire, and then all of a sudden, it runs perfectly fine. They drove it on the highway here on the highway. It ran like a clock. So we got to put our thinking caps to figure out what's going on with this. But there's some commonalities with other cars I've fixed before. Here's a warning when you buy a used vehicle. Don't always believe what it says on the speedometer. In this case, the speedo says 133853. Somebody was stupid. We look under the hood, 245,759. This is Jasper engines. A Jasper remanufactured engine was put in. So that's a remanufactured engine. So we have no idea what the mileage is now, but it's obviously well over 250,000 miles. It's got a lot of mileage on it, and it's sat for quite some time. We're going to look at data right away because the check engine light's on, but a lot of people have checked this thing out and they'll say, ah, we can't find out what's wrong. There's no codes for the engine not running right, and they're scratching their heads. So, first thing we're going to do is look at the data and realize one thing. On this baby, fuel pump inside a gas tank. If a car sits for years, often the fuel pump will rust 
Crudo collecting the gas tank. This baby might need the gas tank completely taken off and or replaced and a new pump put in because they'll often go bad sitting all those years with old gasoline in them. Now in normal conditions a car that sat all that time and then she got it in the last year she's only been able to drive it for three weeks so it's been sitting. I changed the fuel filter but see by looking at the door it was made in 10 of 04 which counts as an 05. Unfortunately in this vehicle the fuel filter is inside the gas tank. You got to drop the gas tank to get to it. They advise changing the filter and the pump as a unit when they go bad. And when I looked around, lo and behold, there isn't a filter in front of the gas tank. There's only fuel lines coming out. Now we're going to start with data. I'm trying X-Tool D9. This is one of their top of line ones. And I've had pretty good luck with these. Look at the code report. Okay, what do we have? Insufficient switching of bank one, sensor one, idle speed low, heating and air conditioning, we don't care about that in the radio. We're only interested in the oxygen sensor not switching on bank one, and that the idle speed is low. Now this engine is a Vortec 4200, and they're really dependable engines. Now, I do have to wonder why the original engine replaced, but still that's 245,000 miles. We don't know how people treated the previous engine. This one was rebuilt by Jasper, and as it stands now, it's running like a clock. I doubt if there's any engine problem. To me, I'm thinking fuel problem, because it sat so long. So numero uno, first, we're gonna clear the code. All cleared. Then we're going to look at data. We'll look at the powertrain data, look at live data, engine live data. Here we go. Damn, they're still kind of squirrely, so we'll start with fuel trim, because I think it's got a fuel problem. You can see the short-term fuel trim as it stands now is perfect, and the long-term is subtracting 2%. That's not bad for a vehicle that's probably got well over 250,000 miles on it. Sure feels like it's starving for fuel not enough fuel which would be the fuel tanks probably gonna need to be taken off and cleaned probably gonna need another fuel pump that's gonna be all rusty for sitting for years and when you change that you change the fuel pump and filter assembly that's inside the gas tank because you can see as we rub it up the value doesn't change any other than long-term fuel trims adding four percent now it's back to zero and you can see i'm flooring it and the rpms actually went down and it's running worse i have my foot on the floor now look and it just stalled out. From this data after we started, the injector pulse width, watch, we rev it up, it's going up like it's supposed to. It's being given the right amount of information. But it won't rev over a certain RPM. And I know something else, the EVAP vent solenoid is venting the whole time. It should be turning itself off. When we're sitting here and drive, it should not be venting. But it is. So there's a problem with the EVAP vent solenoid. Well, face the facts, this thing sat for years, and then in the last year, it's only been driven for two or three weeks. It's probably got multiple problems. You can see the whole time we're driving, the EVAP vent solenoid is venting. So see, even though the temperature is normal, right in the middle, we're running an open loop, not even closed loop. So the whole time, the vehicle is running in warm-up status. It has not reached open loop. So something is keeping it from running an open loop where everything is gonna start feeding back. The oxygen sensor will tell the computer how much fuel to give in it. It's in open loop, it's not in closed. We want it in closed loop. It's gotta go in a closed loop to run correctly. On this other data system, we see the short-term fuel trim zero. It's minus 2% long-term fuel trim, that's nothing. Now we got lucky and then the first thing that came immediately back was oxygen sensor, high voltage, bank one, sensor one. I cleared that code. It immediately came back. So, we're going to get an oxygen sensor for this thing. Here it is in this plastic bag. If it goes bad, it'll keep the car in open loop. It won't run right until it's in closed loop. So, we're hoping this is the only thing that's wrong. It's logical because I'd set all the codes off to zero. It had no codes. Immediately, it tripped the code for this. So, we're going to hope this fixes it, at least to get it running good enough. Like I say, it's probably going to have to have the gas tank pulled, cleaned out, fuel pump filter changed. That's all future considerations. The obvious things first. These things are tall, so get yourself a little step ladder here. There's a sensor. Bolts on right down here. We'll have to get all this air intake crap out of the way. Now this is all rusted, so we put a vice grip player and a screwdriver here. So now when we turn it, we should be able to unscrew it. And there it goes. What an annoying pile of crap. Now we can get it out of the way. Take that off. 
Get that out of the way. Now we have some working room. Even though this is still annoying as can be. Now I have an oxygen sensor wrench that fits on there. So we'll put it on. As you can see right there. There it is. It fits on. We'll pull it off. And I mean pull. These things can be stuck on. Never much fun, that's for sure. We'll push as hard as we can. Break it loose. In case it just slips, so we're getting a longer extension bar here. And now when we push, there she goes. It's breaking loose. Longer is always better. Now we'll unplug the other end of the oxygen sensor and unscrew the rest of it by hand. And out it comes. Now before we put it back together, we'll make sure both ends are the same, the plug ends are the same. And you'll notice there's a lot of rust and corrosion on this. Now just the fact that that's all kind of rusty shows this thing sat. Fuel's probably all messed up. Might have to have the tank replaced or the pump replaced, but we know this isn't working, so we're going to replace this first. Just screws in, then we tighten it using the socket. And you get it nice and tight so it doesn't get any air leaks. It's got a crush washer, so you snug it up and maybe a quarter of a turn, and that's it. And don't forget to plug it back in or it won't work. Just snaps in one way. There it goes. Snapped in, and then the end plugs in here so it doesn't fall out. Put the air box. Back on, tighten the clamps, make sure that's on solid, tighten all the clamps, and the stupid half broken one. Then we'll reset the computer, we'll turn the key on so it'll communicate. Then we go to the scan tool, see, as we can see there's the oxygen sensor code, so we're going to clear it. Now we're going to start it up, take it for a spin. So we'll take it for a good 10-15 minute spin, see how it acts, and then look at the data. So far it's running perfectly fine. Now it's an old truck, don't believe the 133, we know it's at least 250,000. Got a lot of miles on it. It's running smooth, we come to a stop. We'll roll the window up too since we're gonna go faster. It's idling perfect so far. It's been pretty smooth for a transmission that's got a quarter of a million miles on it at least and the engine's running really good but then again it was a jasper remanufactured and it's probably only been in there maybe 30,000 miles or something for spin in the country so far it's running like a clock this thing's so old i'm not going to mess around with the drag strip stop we're just going to drive it fast and see what happens you can see it's going way over what it went before we're only going to three smooth shift it's actually running like a clock now We'll take it to the other end of the airport and come back. All right, here we go through the green light. Make a little turn. No problem with the stalling or anything. Lord, it's accelerating good. Hey, good news. So far, so good. And there we have it. You can see the loop status. Closed loop. So what have we learned? Well, we learned that if your car's a problem and it's staying in open loop and not closed loop, you have to fix that first. Because if it stays in open loop, it's gonna think the engine isn't all warmed up, give it the wrong amount of fuel, won't run right. Always fix that first. In this case, it's an old vehicle, so it was only 45 bucks for the oxygen sensor at O'Reilly's Auto Parts store, so hey, didn't cost much for the part. And we also learned something else out, that the Jasper engines and transmissions did a really good job rebuilding this engine. Smooth, still has a lot of power. Now it was running like crap, it wasn't the engine's fault, it was the oxygen sensor fault. Now some of that could have been from the old gas being in there a really long time, so I'm gonna tell her an old trick my grandfather taught me years ago. And that's this, unless you're willing to drop the gas tank, flush it all out, probably put a fuel pump and a filter in it, pretend that the one quarter mark, when it's down to one quarter of a tank, pretend that's E. And when it gets down there, fill it up. Just don't use that bottom because there could be a lot of crud on the bottom. And as long as you keep it full, half, a little under half, it might not act up all. But if you find you get low, under a quarter starts acting up, you're gonna have to pull this tank. Well, to begin with, this is a Tennessee car, so you can see it's clean, it's not rotten away, so you don't have to worry about rust on the frame or anything. You got a four liter single overhead cam V6 engine. It's actually a very reliable engine. This one's got 160,000 miles, doesn't burn any oil. These are great engines because there's no turbos on them. They're normally fuel injected, so they don't have problems with any carbon buildup. And it's pretty well set up when they do break for replacing parts. The problem with these Fords, of course, is that this isn't a plain old rear wheel drive one, which is simpler. This, you can see, you can have auto, 4x4 high, 4x4 low. The weakest thing 
is the four-wheel drive system. It costs more, it weighs more, and of course it makes these things gas hogs. He says he probably averages about 16 in this thing. If you don't need a four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive vehicle, my advice is don't buy it, especially if you're buying an older one. Now, he's put 80,000 miles on it. He's got his 10 grand worth out of it, but let's say you are gonna buy this vehicle today, I would try to talk you out of it. It's gonna be super expensive, when it finally goes out, it's probably going out a little now. We're gonna check it with a scan tool. Now, on the other hand, if you're a mechanic like me, you can find a lot of good looking ones like these in the South that don't move under their own power and you can pick them up for four or 500 bucks. Then you could put the transmission transfer case in yourself. If you're a riverboat gambler, you like rolling a dice, try one in a junkyard, but really the age of this, they're pretty worn too, you're better off getting remanufactured units. If you're willing to spend that kind of money, go right ahead. Consider what a new 4x4 costs. Hey, you gotta put four or five grand in one that you picked up for 500 bucks. That's not a bad deal. But if you're the type of person that's looking for something you're gonna buy used and you wanna drive the family around in, I'd stay away from one of these 4x4s with 160,000 miles on it. Now let's start it up. Start right up. And as you can hear and see, the engine's running smooth, doesn't make too much noise. These are excellent engines. It's the transmissions on these all-wheel drive ones that have the problems. Now, he's already replaced the hub on this side. I'm assuming this one's probably going to need replacing. Probably have some slippage, but for computer and look at the data first. And while it's looking up stuff, you can see this is a work truck. He's got all the stuff in here. AC gauges, you name it. You can use these for a work truck. Now he actually does use the four wheel drive in his business and stuff. When it snows, doesn't sell you much around here, but it does once in a while, but mainly for mud and goop and rain and all that stuff. It does work well. Just realize with the Fords, it has a limited lifespan. It's looked up, you just got everything explored, a 2V4 liter automatic. So up it comes, diagnosis. And here we go with an auto scan. And we're scanning around, you see he's not lying. It just turned 160,000 miles on it. And it really doesn't look that bad. Of course, it's a Ford, so the radio's broken. But on the plus side, the air conditioner still works. And yes, it does have a sunroof. And now uh, you can see there's a few faults here. So we're gonna go through them all. This is low, we don't care about. Occupant classification system, we don't care about that either. So we'll turn it off, we'll turn it back on, and We'll erase that stupid code. Now it's got a gem module, general electrical module. There's some codes there. They might lead to something. There's four of them. Double go with a fourth. They'll get wacko electronics up. You can see there's a whole bunch of them. But we really don't care. Lamp, headlamp, input circuit, short to ground. Okay, so what he's done is he's replaced the headlamps with the LEDs. And that's why he has all these headlamp codes because it confuses the system. Now they work. The warning light comes up on the dash, but uh, it's Tennessee. Nobody does any kind of inspections. We don't care. The headlights work. But for those of you who live in some place where they check all that crap, realize you can't just replace stuff with LEDs. You got to make sure you have the right bells, resistors, all kinds of other crap. So, you know, if your headlights work okay, my advice in that case is leave them alone. If you got a Ford. Now, a Toyota, they don't care. You just put the LEDs with bells, resistors, away they go. These are a little more particular. So, and the last one is satellite audio digital receiver system. Considering that the radio doesn't doesn't even work, you know? I don't think you're gonna care much about that. But we'll see what it says just for kicks. ECU electronic control unit internal fault and electronic control unit internal fault. Okay, well, really? Sensors for the radio system, we really don't care. What he's curious about is what kind of shape the powertrain's in. So we want to look at the live data. There's all the live data. We'll start looking at it. So far, everything's looking pretty good. We can see the output shaft data. We'll put it in gear. Now you can see it's zero because we're in gear and it's not spinning anymore. We put it in park, it'll start spinning again. So we just, we know that data's being applied and it, it's real data. You see there's no misfires. The fuel rate pressure, 370, 364, 368.45. So it's real close what it's commanding and what it's getting. So even the fuel pump's in excellent shape. Here's the fuel pump percentage. Okay, it's running at 24% now. If we rub it up, of course, it'll go higher. These injectors are fine. They got no faults. It's a four liter engine and the mass airflow sensor is 3.95. Thing two, that's right spot on. That's working fine. The, the module's fine, 14.21. And you can see in the transmission, the output shaft speed failure mode, 
That has no faults. Pressure control modules on the transmission, no fault. Gives you their pressure. Shift solenoids on. It shows there's no faults with the shift solenoids either. And the torque converter unlocking due to slipping. There's no faults in that. So if it is slipping, it's not slipping bad. But what we're going to do here is... We're going to put down torque converter data, and we're going to record it, and here we go. Still handles decently, but he's worried about his transmission, so. The lift gate jar is open because he got something out of the trunk and didn't close it, so you can't blame the truck on that, right? It's way too hot in here. The heat works. We'll turn that off. Now, I can feel a slight slippage taken off there, but we'll go to our little drag strip, and here we go. Still got plenty of pulling power. The engine's working fine. The tranny isn't horrible. I can feel a little slippage, but let's see what it does when it's under a full load. There's nobody behind us, so here we go. Hey, it still takes off pretty good. Full load. Decent shift. Another decent shift. We'll let go. Downshift's very smoothly. No jerking yet. Now we'll see what passing gear goes like. We'll floor it. Smooth, still working pretty good. All in all, I meant to afford things rattle as they age, but hey, it's still running pretty good. Oh, Bonnie and Clyde, they used to steal Fords all the time because they said they were nice, fast getaway cars. And hey, this thing, it's still got get up and go with 160,000 miles. Now, I notice when I turn it hard here, I can feel a little slippage in the right front. Now, he's changed the hub on the left front, so he should change the hub on the right front. But when you're going straight, you don't feel any of that. Now, as I said earlier, if this had been a conventional two-wheel drive Explorer with just rear-wheel drive and not the all-wheel drive system, I would tell somebody if they're going to buy this vehicle, go ahead and buy it because there's no coach in the transmission and no problems. But with that transfer case, I'd be real leery about buying one of these things used in an all-wheel drive version. So we'll go back in time here. We'll start looking at the information as it plays back. And all of that is black. It's all normal. It didn't slip much at all. 160,000 miles now. He's put 80 of them on. He's getting his money's worth. He did have to change that hub and eventually he'll have to change the one on the other side. Transmission isn't slipping too much. You saw on the road test, upshift, downshift. The engine runs like a top. Now, if I had a customer looking to buy this thing, I would try to talk them away, find one with the four wheel, all wheel drive system on it because that will eventually break and cost a fortune to fix. If this had been just the rear wheel drive one, I would have put hands down, buy it at a good price because it's in excellent shape. Yeah, the radio doesn't work. Who cares? You can put another radio in it. Got stupid communication codes. We don't care about that either. With the four wheel drive system, I would be exceptionally leery if I were you buying one with 160,000 miles unless they had information that the transfer case has been replaced or rebuilt, front assemblies have been replaced left and right. It's not going to go three, 400,000 trouble free miles. With a Ford, unlike Subarus, the all wheel drive systems have a limited lifespan on it. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.